Oh, do you remember, Derek, of the time when you emerged as a serious talent on the British athletic scene? Um, yeah, I think when I emerged as a serious talent, I suppose for me it was 1984, making the Olympic trials, which I didn't think I would have a chance of, of, of making, but just to make it to the trials, there was a trials to make it to the trials, if that makes sense. And I made it to there, finished sixth, and had a very outside chance of going to the 88, uh, sorry, 84 games, but just missed out by a couple of tenths. So I think that was when I realised that this was the game for me. Okay, but then 91 was perhaps one of the highlights of your career when you were part of the squad that won the uh, 4x400 title, world title in Japan. Would you remember of that occasion? Um, world Championships, 1991 Tokyo. I can pretty much remember it. I could, I could talk for you through the next 24 hours the 24 hours leading up to the race, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, great, great um, event, obviously a fantastic result for us, expected to finish second. Um, we uh, swapped our order around from the original order, it was me to Chris to John to Roger, we went Roger to me to John to Chris, and uh, you know, gave Chris the bat and a couple of metres behind Antonio Pettigrew, and, and, and Chris ran him down, pulled out with about 40 metres to go, went past him, over the line. Thank you very much. Gold medal in the pockets, and it's still there now. Because the Americans were quite a big, uh, there was quite a big rivalry between the Brits and the Americans. At that time. Massive rivalry between uh, the Brits and the Americans, and the Americans hadn't been defeated for something like 57 years at world or Olympic level yeah. in the men's 4x400. So they pretty much owned that event. Uh, they claimed they owned it, and there was a lot of there was a lot of banter leading up to that final because the Americans obviously thought they were going to win. It must have been quite a motivation for you all at the time. Then. Yeah, I mean, it, there, was, there was a lot of it done in, in jest. We, you know, we got on with a lot of the guys and the coaches who were, you know, having a bit of a laugh with us because we all at times spent time training out in America and knew all the coaches and goodness knows what. But there was a sort of an underlying feeling that we wanted to kick some serious butt, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, a bit of a bit of jest, but it was very serious for us. Okay, there was a lot of UK time at 400 metres at that time, but it tailed off towards the back end of the 90s. Um, assess. How it is at the moment? Um, you're right. I mean, in my career, in, during my own sort of uh, career, uh, I say unfortunately, it, 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 it's a good thing. But yeah, it was hard work. You know, you had Roger Black, you had Akabusi, just coming off the end of their careers. You had people like Phil Brown and Todd Bennett. Then you had people like um, Mark Richardson, Addy Maffey, um, Jamie Balch, you uh, and Thomas, all these guys that were churning out sub 45, you know, sort of times. Yeah. Uh, and it was great. And then, uh, you know, it sort of tailed off. And I think we're now just starting to, to get back. Matthew Hudson Smith and Martin Rooney. Martin's been around for a few years and has shown a lot of promise and has run a few quick times. Yeah. But all of a sudden now, this young kid's come on to see Martin, uh, Matthew uh, Hudson Smith. And him and Rooney have got a bit of a rivalry. And I think that could sort of take the event back to you know to how it was because in 85 it was Roger and I we had a bit of a rivalry and we brought a lot of other people on um, unknowingly and I think the same could happen with Matthew and with Martin so it's starting to look good again and the Roulet squad is looking pretty tasty as well. You won many admirers around the world for the way you've refused to quit after injuring your hamstring during the 92 Olympic semi-final. Uh, what can you tell me about that experience? Um, it wasn't the greatest experience, 1992 uh, Olympic semi-final, uh, obviously won the first two rounds and then, as you say, pulled my hamstring in the, in the, in the semi and, and, and got up and finished the race. And it was really for my, own, for my own well-being and my own purpose that I did it for and it was received in, you know, in, 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 a, well, in, a, in a fantastic way. Um, I still am frustrated with the event and I can honestly say, and I've gone on record of saying this and I'll say it again, I wish the hamstring had pulled in the final and not the semi-final because at least I would have come away with a personal best yeah. because if I'd finished that race I certainly would have smashed my personal best and that's the one disappointing thing I've got to live with is not knowing how fast I could have run. That's the real, real wounder that I have with what happened in Barcelona. And the injury that you sustained that day ultimately led to your retirement. If you'd explain a little about the the medical process that you went through, it was quite lengthy, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, I, I, I the original injury was a torn hamstring, um, which is the obviously hamstring, the muscle at the back of the leg. That was the original injury, but by carrying on, I ended up pulling the, the, the muscle away from the bone, and it was that that I had to go and have reattached, and it was that that kept on disattaching uh, or unattaching, um, and seven times over in eighteen months, and that's pretty much what 
what brought my career to you know to a premature end. Um, so yeah, so that was that was that was tough times. Those eighteen months to try and get over that seven operations in eighteen months is no picnic. Um, but you know, but you're a stubborn guy, and the doctor was it one of your specialists told you that you wouldn't represent your country again. Yeah, um, after the after the last operation, I got I went to see the surgeon. He called me in and said, "Look, it's not happening. Your career's over. You'll never compete for your country again. Go and get a real job." That was pretty much his words. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, three years later, I sent him a picture of me playing basketball for England, sort of saying, "You know, thanks for your confidence, signed Derek Redmond, mm -hmm. international athlete and international basketball player." Uh, <laughs> so yeah, kind of got my own back. So I think my wife would agree as well as the the surgeon that I am pretty stubborn. <laughs> well, you, since you've you not obviously you've not finished with all sports, but in the intervening years since the end of your athletics career, you've earned a really good reputation as a motivational speaker. Explain to me your approach to that and how you're able to help people. Yeah. Well, it's quite funny because it was something I had no intentions of getting into motivational speaking, and it literally happened by accident years and years ago. I got asked if I would, you know, um, accompany someone at an event that he was speaking at because he felt that I had what it takes to be a motivational speaker and I come and said well what's one of them what do they do and this and that and anyway he sort of took me under his wing um, and I did the event with him uh, it was over a couple of days and then I went away and started to put my own presentation together and this would have been 1997 uh, 1998 and I think I got my first sort of proper engagement in 1999 and I never looked back. I've never looked back. Absolutely loved it. I love the buzz of being on the stage. I enjoy helping people understand and realise that they're not the only one who goes through problems. And whether it's in sport, whether it's in business, you know, there's a lot of underlying factors that I've learned from the world of sport that is very relevant in the world of business, in the world of education. Um, and I do get a buzz out of, you know, out of helping people. And 20 odd years later, after Barcelona, to this day, I still get emails from people and, um, and, and, and tweets and, and messages on Facebook saying how they've just come across this particular video and how it's helped them in certain ways. And that, you know, that means a lot to me. Excellent. Now, you signed up with Champions, you joined our team here. What attracted you to, to Champions and what are you hoping to achieve as a result of the bomb? I've, I've, I've been stalking John for a few years now. I wanted to, uh, I mean, I've known John over a number of years. I've played in a couple of um, you know charity golf events that Champions have, have, have put on, the yeah. British Bar Free Championships and goodness knows what. And I like the way John operates, but I see a lot of the people that he represents all over the place they're always busy they're always doing things and, I, and I've looked and thought you know what these are the kind of guys that I want to be involved with from the outside they looked very professional and you know everything seemed to be absolutely perfect that no stone was left unturned and every event that I went to that champions had an involvement in seemed to run pretty seamlessly yeah. and I you know I, I approached John and the first time John and I spoke he was yeah okay yeah I know who you are but you know let's talk you know we'll leave it for now and then I sort of passed him a bit more and, and in the end uh, a couple of years ago last year um, um, I think Willie Thorne was was poorly and he needed someone to, to fill in to do some auctioning at, sure. um, at short notice and I said John I'll do it I don't want any money I just want you to see me in action um, and I think that's what really you know got the ball rolling um, and, and then John sort of, um, we met up and we had a conversation and then he said, right, give me a couple of months. We've got some major changes happening here in Champions and I think you can, you know, can be a part of it. Uh, and lo and behold, to his word, a few months later he called me up and, you know, here I am as part of the team. So it's something I've been wanting for a while, so I've been stalking you guys at Champions for a bit. Well, it's great to welcome you on board. I hope everything goes well over the next few years. And thanks very much for your words today. Thanks very much. Cheers.